I believe in gravity, which is why this apple is here. I believe that every one of us stands on this earth and that is the thing that binds us together. So really we have an association simply by the fact that we have a common ground and it's the common ground that links us all together. And really when you believe in that holistically, you then end up making connections with people. That's what a landscape architect does from my perspective. A landscape architect deals with the collective elements, everything that is the land that we stand on and pushes it in such a way that it is holistically sustainable, thinking primarily about social sustainability and the fact that really if we don't come together in the landscape, we're never going to come together at all. So really that's, that's where my design principles come from. It is really about community when it comes to landscapes, whether they're urban or rural. I think the greatest challenge is actually the act of bringing people together. That's actually what's going to save the world. An embassy of knowledge. I wanted to talk about symbolism and embassies as a lead into this. I had the pleasure of working on the US Embassy in Berlin. Uh, it was a competition win between Moru Budel and Hannah Olin at the time. It was an interesting time politically because it started prior to the African embassy bombings. And then when the African embassy bombings happened, everything got retrenched and the landscape became more important because it be had to be defensible. The building retreated, it became significantly, it's a very public site, this is in Pariser Platz in Berlin. And the landscape then had to mitigate security issues as well as symbolism. So you get, uh, for the ambassador's terrace landscape, which overlooks the quadriga, you get a symbol of agriculture on the right and uh, various other concepts of the American landscape, in this case, the landscape of the Northwest, throughout various parts of the embassy. It ended up being iterated um, as a backyard, the concept of a backyard, a backyard with Ellsworth Kelly, but a backyard nonetheless. But it was, a, it was an extraordinary effort in trying to create a symbol for the United States while dealing with a great deal of thought on security. I had the opportunity to get Olin involved in the US Embassy in London competition, and we chose Richard Meyer, Kieran Timberlake, and Morphosis to work with, and they ended up having to be three of the four that ended up to the finals. I took Morphosis, my colleague Dennis McGlade took Richard Meyer, and uh, Hallie Boyce took Kieran Timberlake. Kieran Timberlake won but I thought I would show you some of the thoughts that went into this guy right here. Obama had a very different attitude than Bush about embassies. Bush had men with machine guns, rightly, because during his administration, 9-11 uh, happened, but men with machine guns standing in front of every embassy. And so it became a really unnerving thing to go and visit embassies throughout the world, but Obama had a different attitude. The idea was take away the machine guns, make the security as transparent as possible, and having, have somebody standing out there with their hand extended saying, welcome to the United States Embassy, how can I help you? That's a very different attitude in terms of design than the prior thinking. And so what we were given was the premise that it should be absolutely transparent, it should be a pavilion in the park, it should be something very open, and this is how we began to think about it. There are these things called ayats that are in the Thames. There are islands of deposited stone that become settlements of land and settlements of people. It's actually the first folks to live in London were those that occupied ayats within London. And so I took this idea of an ayat and said, well, they eventually channeled the river Thames, but what if we took a remnant ayat and actually built the pavilion on top of that and tried to figure out how to make this part of the design? Um, so the idea was to create this structure that sat prominently on top of the ayat and then deal with the security of it as well as the sustainability. The goals were they were going to sell the embassy in Grosvenor Square. That money, $500 million, would pay for everything with this new embassy, but that this embassy would begin to pay for itself in its sustainable gestures. So every ounce of water had to be captured. It had to generate energy. It had to do all the things that, uh, as a, a representative to the world, the best things of the United States out in foreign territory. And so for the ambassador's garden, I began to think about the relationship between two men, one English and one American, John Bartram and Peter Collinson. He was a Quaker cloth merchant. He was a farmer in Philadelphia. And the two of them had a longstanding conversation that dealt with plants. And so the ambassador's landscape was intended to be all native American plants. 
uh, and they would be distributed throughout the site, but largely within this parterre garden that everybody had to pass through in order to get into the building. Tom took it further. Because this was London, he took the volume of St. Paul's and, at my suggestion, the Capitol building, and iterated an internal volume within the embassy that became this great common space. As I said, unfortunately, we did not win, but I thought you know, it was a, a great gesture towards symbolism as embassies go. And so I come back to this slide of Lenfest Plaza, and I come back to us at the Academy. I suggested to you that really what I, how I defined success is the notion that two very different types of people might come together in a public space. I often say a chemistry professor or a young protester. And a result of this space that I've designed, they feel comfortable to sit next to each other. And in the act of sitting next to each other, they come up with a conversation. And that conversation generates an idea. And that idea, 10 years down the road, saves the world. I will have been successful because I created the place in which that idea was formulated. That's my vision of what landscape architecture can do for people, and it's how I drive my own practice. So two, I think uh, this notion of coming together exists for us mostly in the concept of where we sit and dine. For the most part, we work behind uh, oyster-colored big white doors, and then uh, through the benefits of the Rome Sustainable Foods Project, we actually come and meet at tables. And this wonderful assortment of people comes together. And somewhere down the road, we're actually going to have some extraordinary idea. It might be between Bruno and Cyrus. But those two guys are going to come up with an idea that someday will save the world. And it's this notion that here is this great amount of food, this one thing that actually unites us in support of the pursuit of knowledge. And that, to me, is an extraordinary vision, because suddenly I'm saying, oh, wait. The Rome Sustainable Foods Initiative does the same thing that I do as a landscape architect. And I really just want to see, in terms of the vision of our landscape, whether it couldn't be made more, more whole. Holistic, comprehensive view, a symbol of the United States on Roman soil, presenting to other people what the greatness of the United States can render. So a few metrics. Freshwater is a finite element. There, it actually exists on this earth. In um, 500 BC, there were 100 million people. Uh, as of March 2012, there were 7 billion people. There's the same amount of fresh water then. There's the same amount of fresh water now. We all need fresh water to exist. So there's less of it per person. On the globe, only 2.5% of it is fresh water. And of that, only 0.37% is accessible. So it's a small amount of water for a lot of people. So water should be considered a very precious resource. So two, food issues. If we start thinking about what it takes to allow one person to survive on an amount of acreage, one year of food per person, it takes 22,300 square feet, approximately 0.5 acres, to sustain one person. So the McKinmead and White site, the site that we are on right now, is 4.4 acres, just to give you some adjustment there. If you are a vegetarian for one year per person, fruits, grains, vegetables, you need approximately 20,000 square feet. Uh, one year of wheat, 3,000 square feet. One year of eggs for one person, 65 square feet. Uh, one year of dairy. Cows are not a very effective form of getting uh, milk. Nubian goats are much better. I suggest Nubian goats. And uh, one year of meat, two servings per week, it takes this many pigs. One year of use of a typical push mower, of which we have two in the back. And we actually looked up the model and figured out how much it does. 87 pounds of CO2 and 54 pounds of other pollutants per year. Um, one hour of use is equal to 40 automobiles going for one hour. Um, these are not very efficient, folks, if you're not getting this. One hour of use, 100-mile uh, automobile ride for a single car. The Academy, it takes one time to do the Academy lawn is four hours for the whole thing. So that's like going from, to Rome and Florence and back in a car each time they do the lawn here. So you might think maybe we should use less lawn. I don't know. Maybe. Bruno. <laughs> this is about balance. He's my little reminder of, you know, there are good things and bad things in the world. Uh, it's all about balance. If the goal is use less water, use less energy, use uh, less labor, but make ourselves more productive, that's a great goal. 
I know that there are many things that I'm not dealing with this, in this talk. There are code issues, there are the cost of Italian labor, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not citing. I recognize that that exists. This is not meant to be you know, heaven on earth. This is, I, I recognize that there, there are realities, but it's about balancing these issues. And um, that's what I want us to think about when we're looking at these things. In my first year after graduate school in 1990, I joined Hannah Olin in Philadelphia, and they had received the commission from the Academy to do the Academy's landscape. It was considered a prestigious project as well it should have been, and so I wasn't allowed to work on it because I was a newbie. Um, but I got to watch the process, and this happens to be the existing conditions in 1989. I think it's very interesting to look at some of these things very quickly. There's a very disheveled Villa Aurelia here, a lot of different piecemeal things at Caraviglio. There is a flower garden, cutting garden here in the backyard as well as the tennis court. Slightly larger orchard here. Anyway, it was a very interesting and lightning thing to look at this drawing again, particularly when this was the drawing that became the vision plan. So this was the 1990 response from uh, Hannah Olin. It's heavily dependent upon Gorham Stevens' plan of 1928. The proposal was to have a fellow's walk that Stevens' plan actually acknowledged that there should be an axial relationship in the back of the property. So the tennis court is to be moved to the property adjacent to the ambassador site. The uh, Caraviglio property has this wonderful uh, clipped LA that leads down to the terrace. The Triangle Garden looks like the iteration of the overlook that used to exist there prior to the Academy's purchase. And uh, the Villa Aurelia looks much more refined, including a secret garden in the back there. I would say that probably a, not a lot of this got built. There's a lot of things that come into play when it happens when you make proposals like this, whether there's money available, whether a donor likes it or not. There are a lot of things that can cause challenges to getting a vision created. But uh, it was an interesting proposal. My attitude, uh, and this is the attitude in the industry, a, a master plan should be revisited every 15 to 20 years. An institution changes, people change, conditions in the world change, money changes between years. So every 15 to 20 years, you should have a new vision for where you want to go. It's called an adjustment or a framework. This is the existing condition. This is basically the previous drawing photoshopped into the current conditions. So it's the plan of the, the campus as it exists now. And what I wanted to talk with you about as I close up is just this portion right here and make some suggestions. It would be political suicide to come here and tell you this is what should be done. I haven't talked to anybody about this. I'm just suggesting that there might be some things that we want to think about given the metrics that we've seen, the symbolism that we've seen, the things that we want to promote as Americans on a foreign soil and this pursuit of knowledge that we all uh, try to do. So we're going to talk about the front yard first. It is largely lawn. It's a beautiful entry. It is verdant green. It is a great symbol of the American Academy and, and America in general. But that's a lot of lawn to use. And wouldn't it be better to actually use something that did not require as much water, such as Thymus praecox, which is a verdantly green plant. It grows close to the ground. It is a Mediterranean plant. Once it's established, it needs little water. It has the other benefit of blossoming in the spring, so it's this white carpet. Because that lawn is not walked on very much, when people do walk on it, you get the fragrance of time floating up from it. But it can take people walking on it the way that we used to walk to the lecture hall when it was in Collins' studio in the fall. It can take that kind of abuse. But it doesn't require a lawnmower, and it doesn't require sprinklers once it's established. Similarly, the backyard, which is a beautiful verdant landscape, it's just lovely. It is a backyard, and we use it all the time. It's incredibly flexible. It allows us to have our parties, our future soccer games, other events that take place here. But it is intensively watered, and it is not a landscape that is native to this area. So what happens when you get too much water going into a landscape like that is you lower the productivity because it causes what's, what's called navel orange split. Any of those fruit trees that gets too much water, the fruit grows too quickly because they're being inundated at a time when the fruit, fruit is ripening and the skin can't expand quickly enough. Therefore, you get the splitting that takes place and the product becomes useless. So if you want a greater productivity, it's actually beneficial to reduce the amount of water. Just keep it in mind when you're thinking about the Rome Sustainable Fruits Project. I go back to the concept of the three natures and say, well, what if this were an organizing principle for how the academy could be rendered as a landscape? And this is my realm of the gods. It's this area that is against the Aurelian Wall and then along the backside of the Triangle Garden and the wall that leads down to the overlook of the Aquapalo. 
And wouldn't it be great, actually, if that were a part of our productive landscape, where the more wild things like berries and chestnuts and other things that the academy wants to ingest or have as product uh, could be harvested. These would be plant materials that are not ornamental necessarily, although they're beautiful because they would flower, they would do many other things besides just be productive. But they're the type of thing that you would venture out into and collect. This is part of an issue for me, and I recognize that I'm an outside observer. I've only been here as long as most of you have, which is seven or eight months, seven months. The idea of the Rome Sustainable Foods Project is an extraordinary one. But from my perspective, and this is my opinion only, the union between the concept of the academy and the Rome Sustainable Foods Project is a sliver, and it should be holistically embraced in such a way that it still has identity. You can still have its own identity, but that the academy actually represents a greater symbol of which that is a smaller part. Everybody wins in that way, and actually, when you think about the landscape as this full spectrum view of a culture, it's actually incredibly valuable. It's valuable in terms of the cultivation of prospective donors. It's valuable in how we describe ourselves in literature. It's valuable in so many other ways than just thinking about it as this, oh, there's this thing, and we join it at the table, and that's it. The best thing about this is we get people out there helping, and you get a, a man who is absolutely a zealot when it comes to these things, sometimes uncontrollably, sometimes less than diplomatically, but he is out there. I love Chris. He's like, oh, i got to get it done. But it benefits us as well. This is my tribute to Piranesi. I just love this photograph. Uh, one Saturday, I was helping in the kitchen, and we went out to pick nettles. I think Siobhan was with us and uh, Philip, who was here previously. This notion that you get this full loop where fellows are in there helping out on Saturdays and we're you know, trying not to screw it up uh, as best we can, but still learn a little bit and have fun. It's a, it's a great sort of story to tell, and it actually represents capital if it's embraced from the top down, and especially in the middle, where it can be a great, great story. And out of it, you get this extraordinary product that's called food that then supports people who want to think. That notion is incredibly poetic to me. When it comes to the Caravilio, it would be great if actually we could expand some of the beds. Not necessarily beautiful beds, as in parterre beds of landscape, but what if this was a place where if we carved out a site that actually became the place where we produced all of a significant number of herbs. If you look at the tally sheet in, uh, for the Rome Sustainable Foods Project, we spend a lot of money and a lot of, obtain a lot of product that is herb related. And it doesn't require a lot to grow, but it would be a great thing to cultivate. Uh, so why not use that land more effectively? In terms of the uh, 5B driveway, it would be great actually if we thought about the fact that people are passing through this, not just as in terms of arrival by car, but people who are walking from 5B into the property. And um, if we think about the fact that the, the issue here is the width of this gate, that as long as we maintain that as a point of access, it would be great if actually we pulled the trees out from the side um, and used them as a part of canopy so that cars could park underneath them and be in the shade, and that their roots wouldn't interfere with the adjacent buildings, but that it becomes an LA that people walk through. So it becomes part of the process of the promenade from the people in 5B um, into the backyard. Similarly, how we think about the knowledge of the library, which is central source for any institution, um, the most important thing is the library, because that's the source of knowledge, the representation of knowledge. How one represents the landscape outside of its main windows should be considered. And I don't necessarily think that this is the best thing. And you know, I recognize that, again, this is where Bruno's balancing. You know, it's really about how you think about um, servicing the backyard, how you think about accessing, dealing with HVAC issues, all of the things that we don't necessarily think about as a day-to-day -day issue. But it doesn't necessarily have to look like this with all of that. And so that's one of the things I'd like to, to be investigating. And then in terms of the last area of the academy, the Triangle Garden as a place to play. I understand, and I may be wrong, that generally speaking, the kids are not supposed to be in the backyard necessarily. The idea was that the kids go to the front yard or to the Triangle Garden. But that's hampered by the fact that there is a lock that requires a key, and it's incredibly exposed. Kids don't like to play in the front yard. 
They don't like to be face down by the building. It's too proper. What kids like are hedges where they can go hide. When you do watch the kids play in the, in the occasional time when they're in the front triangle garden, they literally are playing between the hedge and the fence on the street side or back by the mulch garden. They're rarely playing in the swings. They're rarely playing in the exposed areas. So what if we simply took the triangle garden and actually treated it like one of those London local blocks where they basically hide them within a hedge and people have a key, but instead of a key, we use a swipe card on the front gate so that a parent doesn't have to hold the kid, find the key, open the thing, throw the kid in, all that stuff. All you do is swipe it and go in, right? It becomes our place. But you have a hedge that exists up to six feet. You can still have the aerial hedge. You can still have every other element. But that hedge then allows it to become less formal and a place where everybody can go for an aspect of privacy, but it's still symbolically part of the vocabulary of the formal front yard. And then just this last thing. If we're meant to be seen or we're meant to see, you have to have it happen. So that means there has to be some aspect of our Bora culture that allows, and cooperation with neighbors, that allows the academy to play the same role that the French academy, which is unfortunately positioned where there are no trees in front of it. If we're going to look down on them, then we should at least protect that view. From my aspect, landscape architecture is really about the notion of being. It's about all of us together collectively thinking about great things and coming up with ideas that actually foster a better future for our grandnieces and grandnephews than for ourselves. The great thing about landscape is it actually iterates through entropy. It is this thing that has the balance between static systems and living systems and then changes over time. I design for people of that age or younger, and that is my purpose as a designer. I have hope that in the future, the landscape of the academy, which represents all of you and me together holistically, is the best representation um, of America on foreign soil. So I leave you with that food for thought. Thank you. Thank you.